So welcome, Faye. Welcome back to the graduate school. Is it all right to call you that? And that's yeah, all right. Or Dr. Mao. <laughs> um, and we're just going to ask you some questions yeah. and yeah, just tell us and, and feel free to give us the, the conversational view. Yeah. Um, so tell us about your career path. How did you get where you are today? And was it the route you expected to take? The answer is no. <laughs> I actually, before I come here, I read uh, the promotion, you know, uh, in which uh, my advisor said things about me. She al he always uh, overestimated uh, about me. Uh, <laughs> I actually, uh, no, I did not plan for what I'm doing today. I think everything just happened naturally because uh, of things that I did previously. But one thing that uh, I always tend to do is to try something new. That's just something about me. And uh, I think that's one of the things I want to tell uh, younger students that uh, don't be afraid of uh, stepping into a field, uh, you know, an area that you're not familiar with, because you'll be surprised by what you can gain. You know. Um, um, can I just ask what led you to the University of Oregon? I, Is that a coming question? That's fine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I came to the United States in, uh, well, I came to the University of Oregon in 1985 through a program formed by the Ministry of Education of China and Harvard. So in, in the United States, it's called a Harvard program. In China, it was called a CGP. Uh, for that program, they selected about 40 students, lucky ones, to come to the United States to pursue a PhD in chemistry. So I was one of the lucky ones. That's how I came to University of Oregon. Um, it was a great experience. Uh, something totally unexpected for me. You know, I'm extremely grateful for the education opportunity that the university uh, gave to me. Because this is really the starting point of my professional career, scientific career. You know. Good. Good. Okay. And that actually was sort of as one of the other questions, and you can maybe elaborate on a little bit, you know, how did attending U of O's graduate school affect your career path? Um, or yeah. maybe it didn't affect your career well, path. It definitely did. <laughs> I, I'm, I just, uh, like what I said, right, I think uh, throughout, uh, throughout my life, and I have been lucky, um, to become what I am today, what I'm doing today, it's really because of everything else I did before this point. It just, things just uh, magically, coalesce or lined up, you know, star lined up for me, you know. I, uh, when I came to the U.S., came to the, um, um, become accepted by the chemistry department, I joined the Professor David Tyler's group. He was very enthusiastic uh, and tried to promote his project to me. I was totally convinced. It was really challenging chemistry. Um, so a couple of months later, I kind of regretted it a little bit because it was, <laughs> I didn't expect it was so challenging. So the kinds of uh, chemicals that, that I would have to deal with would have to be protected under inner atmosphere. And I would handle everything in the dark. So doing chemistry, doing science in the dark, as you can imagine, it was very challenging. But I got a lot of help. So the lab mates in the group were extremely helpful. Um, the five-year training, I think, was tremendous um, because, uh, be precisely because it was challenging, it made it everything else I did afterwards easy. You know, like uh, uh, an athlete, you know, that try to overtrain and then afterwards things become easy, kind of like that. That, that was good. I think the most important one would be actually working for David Tyler and. He's, uh, he was a great mentor for me. Uh, he's the one who really guided me, trained me not only as a, a chemist, but also how to be a scientist. Um, he helped me to land my first job. You know, Without that first job, I don't think I would be here talking to you. You know, uh, you know. So again, so what I do today had everything to do with what I did before. And I did not plan for <laughs> this. Great. 
and that's funny because you're anticipating the outside. Which faculty at the U of O had the biggest yeah. effect on your experience well, here? I could be a psychologist. Yeah, you're doing great. You have mind reading. Yeah. Um, so, and if there, if there are any or any others that you want to talk about, or any others that affected you, or how they affected you, but we can also move on to the next question. Uh, I think uh, you know. I mean, of course, I have no comparison, right? Because this is the university, only university I attended. But uh, overall, it was a very positive experience. Um, I really I received a good training. The other thing is they're talking about crossing into other fields, right? Uh, because my PhD research was in the space of inorganic chemistry. Uh, actually, a little bit toward the physical inorganic chemistry. But uh, my first job um, dealt with uh, organic chemistry, which uh, you know, was in a different field. So there was a challenge, but I intentionally took that challenge. But again, my training in physical chemistry well prepared me. Even though I had to learn organic chemistry, you know, uh, fresh, but uh, the physical chemistry provided a huge advantage for me because um, I could uh, have an explanation to everything I was doing uh, for my job. I could uh, predict, for example, given a structure, I could, could predict the physical properties. Or vice versa, I could um, uh, construct a molecule to reach a desired property. That's part of the invention. Um, probably a lot of traditionally trained organic chemistry, uh, uh, chem organic chemists do not have that kind of background. You know, you can be a great uh, organic chemist in making things, but the hardest part is actually um, how do you put things together to reach the desired property, you know. So that was the first challenge I had to overcome uh, when starting the first uh, job. The second challenge was that um, I had to learn biology. That was just totally new for me. Before I started that job, I had no idea even how a cell looked like. Zero idea. So I had to study biology uh, from the beginning um, because uh, the products we were making are for biological studies. So without knowing biology, you just don't know what you were doing, you know. Um, so I just studied the learning biology by reading textbooks. But it helps. My chemistry background uh, helped me study uh, biology because biology is really based on chemistry, the fundamentals of biology. Um, uh, is, you know, is a chemistry principle. Uh, so that wasn't too hard, you know. Um, there are also biology, um, the learning biology gave me a purpose for what I was doing today. It made me much easier to, easier to communicate with our customers. And uh, that actually was really important. So learning organic chemistry, more importantly, learning biology, that really made a huge difference to my career later on. It's uh, just uh, keep crossing into the other fields, you know. And uh, I'm going to tell uh, younger students today, one of my really important lessons for invention, um, for the, all the inventions that I made. And people, you know, the process of invention is the process of conducting, conduct, connecting the dots. But I would like to go one step uh, backward. You know, actually, probably before that, uh, a more important process is to collect those dots. And sometimes the most important dots, the most valuable dots, are in the other field. And of course, you could do this through collaboration. But if you know those dots yourself, it just made things so much easier. You know, so I, I think that's a really big lesson that I've learned here. I benefited by going into the other field. It takes a risk, you know, it takes courage to do that. So a, a while ago, you said that David Tyler taught you to be a scientist. Yeah. Can you say what a scientist is that he taught you to be? You know, uh, an important aspect of, uh, I cannot say about uh, other sciences, you know. For chemistry, I think to some extent, biology is the same. Observation, how to make observation. Uh, that's an integral part of the doing research. And uh, don't any, you know, any unanswered question pass you. Um, 
have an in interpretation, have an answer, you know, try to explain everything you have seen, have explanation. Um, frequently, I mean, even to these days, I go into the chemistry lab, I still, you know, uh, do experiments on a daily basis, even though my company has reached a size that uh, I could simply just ask people what to do. But I really enjoy uh, going, you know, going into the lab and, uh, and actually conduct chemistry myself because the observation is a, is a critical part of science and, and inventions. Sometimes, you know, when people are presented with the same picture and everything, you may reach different conclusions. Interpretation could be different. Uh, really important things can be missed. So I think uh, knowing how to observe things and uh, always trying to be curious, try to find the answer for things. And maybe at the time it may not be important, but later, you know, right, it could turn out to be really important. So I think that's a scientific, uh, part of the really important um, scientific research, scientific investigations. Um, yeah. So you've already given two pieces of career advice okay. to our U of O graduate <laughs> students, try things that are new and, and yeah. develop interdisciplinary yeah. um, knowledge. Um, any other career advice you'd give to U of O graduate students, particularly yeah. those who are considering careers outside of academia? Yeah, yeah, I, I do have some opinion. I have to uh, first admit that uh, before going to industry, I had some preconceived biased opinion about going into industries. Because uh, I, you know, in graduate school or even before that, you know, in undergraduate school, I would consider myself to be a, a hardcore, really science-minded uh, student, uh, you know, a researcher. And uh, somehow I thought that going into industry, you would be doing really boring stuff, repetitive things. You would not be challenged for someone like me who uh, was kind of ambitious. Well, of course, I was completely wrong. Uh, first of all, industry, there are really a garden variety of industry jobs. It really is up to you uh, what to choose. And uh, there are a lot of hugely challenging task, you know, for someone ambitious, you know, um, to go solve, you know. And then, I mean, otherwise we would have a, a treatment for all the diseases, right? So obviously, um, there are a lot of things that are for ambitious people um, to, to, to do. The other thing is, you know, when going into industry, maybe you are faced with choices, right? As I mentioned that uh, at the time, I had the choice of either going into industry to continue to do what I was doing in graduate school, which would be like uh, inorganic chemistry, or do something different. I choose to do something different, of course into the organic chemistry, and then into biology, that I really benefited tremendously. The other thing is, uh, you know, people may be um, presented with choices of going to a large corporation or small companies. But I would say if you are ambitious, you want to really make an impact. You want to learn things, learn how companies are operating. Try a small company. Mm -hmm. And the pay is not really important for your first job. I mean, in graduate school, how much you get, <laughs> do you get paid, right? <laughs> it's going to be a step up anyway. So <laughs> that's the least important, my advice would be. Mm -hmm. Just, of course, the other thing is go work for good people, um, for companies that have good ideas, innovative ideas, and work hard. I know that comes, uh, comes out naturally. I think if you are ambitious, you're interested in something. Working hard should not be a problem. If you feel you, you, you're working too hard, then there's something wrong. You know, right? you made the wrong choice. <laughs> Great. Good. Okay, um, what do you think are the most valuable skills for graduate students um, who are considering careers outside of academia? So skills that they should be yeah. working on? Yes. Hmm? Um, scientific skill, of course, right? That's, that's a must. But beyond that, I think uh, interpersonal skill is extremely important. I think if you are a professor, you may have more freedom. You are more or less, you know, your, your own boss, right? You do whatever you like to do. Students, you know, you can tell students what to do. But in a corporate environment, it's a, a very complex, complex structure. You have people in the ad administrative department. You have people in the research, maybe different research groups. Uh, people who are doing the receiving, shipping. But to make things happen, to make a company successful, it's a truly team effort. Everybody has to contribute. And communication is key. Uh, even among the science groups, for, for example, 
um, communication is critical. Actually, the very last company I worked for, um, Theracens, was a startup medical device company in the business of uh, developing continuous global sensor, actually implantable sensors. That um, endeavor required multiple knowledges, uh, uh, people of uh, different disciplines. It required chemistry, obviously, biology, biochemistry, mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, software engineering, uh, physiology, and people who are in the regulatory department. People have to really work together. I, I have seen situations where people you know, really have trouble interacting with each other. That, of course, you know, led to disasters. You know, things that didn't work out. Um, a lot of time, I think, it's because uh, the people's people skill. I think in graduate school, people may not have a chance to get that kind of training. Uh, maybe in some research group, professor will train you that way, you know. But uh, I imagine m most of the people may focus on just the research part. But uh, going into industry, in my opinion, that's I think uh, to be successful, your social skill is a huge part of that. And I have seen people become really successful with uh, who are maybe not be a technical genius, but the people who take responsibility, who have the team spirit, who can work with other people. Those are the people who tend to be really successful. But of course, if you are a technical genius, right, you are the one who invented and made it work. I mean, you can afford it, you know, right? I mean, uh, company will treat, treat you well. But I would say um, social skill is really a huge part of that. You know. I, I think people should really uh, pay attention to that. You know, technical expertise, skills um, is absolutely necessary, but uh, not the only element, you know, that will lead to success. This is making us feel good because we just added a workshop next year about yeah. conflict resolution for our yeah. graduate students. So <laughs> very important. I, I can't agree more. I, I really I can't agree more. I mean, within my own company, for example, I would definitely promote people who are team leaders. You know, who can because especially uh, in, especially in a small company, the boss is going to be easy. The boss will have a lot of things um, um, that he has to take care of worried about multiple things. But if you can take the initiative, think for the boss, right? Take care of things. You automatically, you will be recognized. You know, that's really important. Um, yeah, teamwork, that's really, I think, uh, it's fundamental to be successful in the company. Okay, tell us about your job today. You know, what do you do? Yeah. What, what, what's a <laughs> typical day or a not so typical day? Yeah, yeah I, I kind of, um, I mentioned to Matt a while ago, Whenever I was in graduate school, right, I, we always worked late, including my boss, David Tyler. He would always come in at uh, 10 or 11 p.m., almost every night, and ask me, Mao Fei, you know, that's like the Chinese name of calling me, um, Mao Fei, anything exciting? <laughs> I would, most of the time, I would tell him, not much, you know, right, to his disappointment. But, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, happy, exciting moments. Um, uh, but anyway, so today, yeah, I can tell them lots of exciting things going on. <laughs> so I'm running two companies at the same time. The first company is in the business of um, supplying innovative fluorescent reagents for life science research. Um, the products are designed to fulfill three major tasks. First one is to help biologists to visualize a biological system. Uh, take a cell, for example. If you look under a microscope, you really cannot make out much details. Uh, maybe you can see something because of the reflection of light. Um, but uh, not a lot of details. So with the fluorescent dye molecules my company are developing, you can strategically color each part of the cells. Uh, each part would be colored with a different color, for example. And then you can see multiple things at the same time. And uh, like, for example, if you look out in the window, you can identify 
what are trees, bushes, long, you know, right, buildings, because they have different colors, you know, right? So that's one task. The second one is to uh, detect biological molecules, both for the presence, absence, or if it's present, the concentration of that biological molecules. This has the practical application. For example, maybe you need to detect a, a biological molecule associated with, uh, let's say, cancer or some sort of infection. So it has a practical diagnostic applications. Thirdly, some of these products can be used to track the biological activity over time. Biological systems, uh, you know, are living beings, you know, right? Uh, so some of the products, uh, fluorescent products, you know, that we develop can let you almost literally watch, watch a movie um, of a biological activity over time. And sometimes you can have these uh, uh, fluorescent molecules um, introduced to a, let's say, an animal. You can do that, or in a living cell or a tissue, for example. So these fluorescent products are now essential tools for life science researcher. I mean, if you open up any life science journal, it would be really hard that you can find any article without using uh, fluorescent dyes, uh, criticals. The reason fluorescent dye, uh, you know, I, sometimes I, when I explain to people how this fluorescent dye works is that I tell people these fluorescent dye molecules are like uh, little spy molecules. They would go into a biological system and then go back and report to you where they are and how much they're seeing things in their sur surroundings. You know, that's basically how, how, how they work. Um, so my second company uh, is a pharmaceutical company, which I co-founded with uh, my business partner, partner Professor Guo Song Liu. Previously, he was a professor at MIT. He's a neuroscience researcher. The company was uh, founded on an accidental discovery made uh, using a molecular tool, a fluorescent dye tool I invented 15 years earlier. Um, it was really interesting. Um, one of his uh, postdocs one day accidentally found out in her petri dish, all of a sudden, the neurons uh, communicated much more intensively than before. Uh, the tool that I previously invented can identify the number of synapses, which are the connections you know, between neurons. You know. Neurons communicate uh, via synapses. So for whatever reason, the number of synapses uh, detected by the fluorescent uh, molecule that I invented was much more. Was like uh, the activity was 30 percent more. That has uh, really big implications because if you could uh, replicate this process in your brain, you would become smarter. Your memory would be better. And uh, if unfortunately you are Alzheimer's disease patient, maybe uh, there's a cure for that uh, or some treatment. So, but anyway, so the, it turned out the mistake was that. Too much magnesium was added to the cell culture. So magnesium was the cause for that. And it was highly reproducible. Within the concentration range, the higher the magnesium, the more synaptic connectivity, more activity, you see. So that got, me, got uh, my uh, business partner really interested. So he called me and told me about this discovery and uh, asked, uh, can we start a company, you know, right? So then I asked him, what com magnesium compound did you use? He told me magnesium chloride. Then I kind of laughed at him. I said, well, that's great. Maybe one day you get a, you'll get a Nobel Prize, but uh, magnesium chloride is not a way to start a business, you know, you know because you can get that e everywhere. But I was really intrigued by this discovery and uh, its huge potential. So I kept thinking about this uh, for weeks, and then I realized it's actually not so simple because in order for this thing to work, you really have to send magnesium from a GI tract to your bloodstream and then cross your blood-brain barrier to go to your brain. And then finally, go inside the neurons. 
there are several opt obstacles you have to overcome. Challenge is always an opportunity. So then I started thinking and uh, applying my chemistry knowledge, trying to come up uh, with a compound that would actually do that, would send the magnesium all the way to the, to the brain to have this effect. So uh, I worked on that for a year maybe. Uh, the good news is finally, we were able to identify, we identified a compound that does exactly what we needed. But I, I, I think, uh, yeah, there was some uh, good chemistry-based reasoning. Uh, but I would say 70% of that is good luck. We just had <laughs> this magic compound, you know. But anyway, once we had that one, we did a lot of animal studies, you know. Uh, consistently, we get a really compelling results to show this compound really does the wonder, you know, yeah, improve the animal's cognitive function, improve the cognitive function of uh, uh, aging animals. We tried also on um, AD uh, model, you know, animals. The results were all good. But, uh, you know, if you talk to an investor or even to a researcher in this field, neuroscience field, they will immediately say, that's great, you know, right? They, they will remind you that uh, before you, people have cured AD and also cancers in small little animals many times over. It's proved it works in humans. Of course, you know, I mean, what have we have the implication of the discovery that we had, you know, the potential in human is extraordinary. And sometimes uh, extraordinary discovery requires uh, extraordinary proof. So that, that's what we, we, we're focusing on now. And fortunately, uh, two years ago, we did a human trial conducted by a third party in Miami. It was very successful. So we proved it really worked in human, but the human subjects we selected were not AD patients. Uh, they were uh, patients, I don't know if I should call them patients, because they are perfectly normal people, just um, people who uh, had impaired, uh, you know, um, memories, uh, called um, MCI, you know, uh, mild cognitive uh, impairment, and also maybe some deep sleep problems. Mm -hmm. And people who have sleep problems also tend to have poor memories. So we selected the subjects. It was a really successful uh, trial. And then last year, we had a collaboration with Stanford University. We uh, tried in real AD patients, a very small scale. Again, it was a proof of concept. The results are exciting, very exciting. So I can only so much, I don't really want to hype up people because uh, the potential the implications are unimaginable. <laughs> so I don't want to get people over excited. So the, you know, you, you cannot declare, you know, in the business of um, um, pharmaceutical research, you, you cannot really declare success until FDA says, okay, you have a drug. So that's why right now we're trying to um, um, attract investors to help us to uh, go to the next step to conduct. But fortunately, FDA agreed that we could uh, directly go to phase two E, we could conduct a you know, large-scale hu human trial, hopefully to prove that it's useful. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. But uh, you know, there are too many exciting things. Uh, sometimes people come to me, can we try this and that, ask, ask to start other companies. But uh, I have to focus on something. You know, <laughs> this, this is more than enough. That's amazing, um, very exciting. So what's the, what's the process from here, large-scale human testing? How long does that take? It is sometimes, uh, you know, um, a difficulty could be recruiting patients, mm -hmm. which by itself takes time. Mm -hmm. And then the actual trial, we believe, based on our results so far, uh, we don't have to uh, spend a long time like uh, some of the earlier drugs designed for AD, which are primarily designed to look, look for a slowing down of the progression. But in this case, we are looking for uh, reversal of the sympathy. So hopefully, 
I, I think we're, we're fairly confident, you know. I think uh, definitely within a year, we, we should be able to um, see results. Wow. Yeah. That's great. It's some yeah. time before I get Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could be for me too, right? I mean, the unfortunate thing is that uh, when you reach the age of 85 or something, you have like a 30 to 40 percent chance to get it. It's a terrible disease, you know, especially um, to the families, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. your caretakers. Great. Yeah. Okay, tell us some of your favorite memories of being at the University of Oregon and, and being in Eugene, besides being in the lab at 10 p.m. Yeah, yeah, exactly. what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, well, actually, yesterday when I left, uh, met my former lab mates, right, we were just uh, we were nostalgic, you know, talking about things we did together. Uh, and we had a great time together. We uh, went out fishing. I think I fished uh, most of the rivers. And I also uh, I went to the coast to, to fish. Too. I remember one time, three of us, you know, we went to maybe, probably, I don't know, maybe a few miles away from the coast. I got really seasick. That was memorable. <laughs> maybe that was a bad memory. It took me days to recover, you know. But we had fun, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the outdoor activity in Oregon. It's a great place. I mean, I would never regret, you know, besides the professional, you know, educational training, but uh, just the, the beauty of the nature, you know, the, the, the environment is unbelievable. Yeah. And related to that, um, from what you've seen, how has Eugene and how has the, the, yeah, and the U of O campus changed? Do you notice things? When you walked in today, you know, people often when they go back to their elementary school say, oh, everything looks so small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I was able to drive my rented car to come here without help. Excellent. So which means there are still queues there, you know, I remember, right? Uh, there are things that are not changed. And then You've been taking that magnesium chloride. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. That is true. <laughs> Not magnesium chloride, my own invention. Ma magnesium chloride doesn't work. <laughs> Don't buy that. Um, so then uh, yesterday, um, Professor uh, Bruce Barnshaw also took me around, the, um, drew around the vicinity of the campus. I saw uh, some of these uh, unbelievable buildings, structures, especially that. Uh, Basketball court, you know, that's like a, I thought it's a, like an opera house and it kind of reminded me of the San Francisco Opera House. <laughs> Amazing structures. The, the, yeah, it's uh, also downtown, some apartment buildings, you know. Um, yeah, well, the rain is still here. <laughs> that gave me a natural affinity. This is Eugene. Actually, you're talking about that. Because yesterday, to get here, I had to go to Portland first. Um, I had to board this small airplane. The moment I stepped that small airplane, instantly, my memory flashed back, reminding me how I came to Eugene the very first time, from San Francisco to Eugene. You know, switching from a Boeing 747 to a tiny airplane. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Great. Well, we, yeah. we hope you'll, you'll come back again and check on the campus oh, sure. and check on Eugene. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Anything else you want to tell us or any other? Good stories about your experiences here, or things you remember. Well, there, there, there are too many, you know. Right? Uh, I, I, I think you know. I mean, this is. A, I really think Eugene is a good place to study for someone because you can concentrate, and then when you take a break, go out to nature, enjoy the nature. Uh, it, it's a great place to pursue a graduate degree or even undergraduate degree, in, you know, uh, in that regard. Just a good, good place to study. People are extremely friendly, I find. Um, you, you know, people will get used to the rain. That's the only part, you know, but, uh, but hey, then uh, nature, you know, uh, it's just really beautiful, uh, unbelievable, yeah. So you fly fished while you were here. I did, Yes. Yeah, with my lab mates, yeah. Yes. I learned, but I'm not an expert, I'm amateur still. Yeah, but, but, but you did most of the rivers yeah. around? Yeah. It's great. So, yeah. so my colleague and I from philosophy, we fly fish too. and oh. Not professional, right? But, but uh, d did you ever fish any of the high Cascade lakes? I fished uh, uh, mostly the, now um, I'm trying to record the name because I, normally I just went with uh, my lab mates, you know, right? Not paying attention to the exact <laughs> locations, you know, because they led the way. 
Uh, Mackenzie for sure. Oh yeah, that that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also did a uh, mountain climbing too. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, almost obviously uh, amateurish, amateurishly, right? I remember one time uh, I went to climb. Is that Mount Thielsen? Is that the, is that the Thielsen? Yeah. Thielsen, right? Uh, this is actually interesting, though, right? Um, when you look how far, you see it's almost like needle-like, you know, mm -hmm. the last 50 uh, feet or so. Um, so I climbed to, uh, I don't know, maybe to the last 50. But so I saw other people had uh, ropes and tools and stuff. So I thought I just, I could do that myself, barehanded, you know, right? And uh, <laughs> I, 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 I did that. I managed to get on the top. And then when I looked down, that's when I got scared. <laughs> When I look at the other side, it was like a 2,000 feet uh, cliff or something, street. And I lost my head, actually. And the most difficult part was to get down. I could not find my footing. But uh, that was an adventure. It's almost like uh, running my business now. When I now, now <laughs> look back, well, how did I get to this point? You know? But when, when you were doing that, you don't think about it. You only look at the, that's where I need to get to, you know, right? Keep on going in one direction. Don't think you know everything else. <laughs> so, yeah. well, we're glad you survived. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That was really scary. Wow. I mean, yeah, scary, very scary. And uh, because on the top, uh, the, the place could only accommodate maybe four or five people. There's a, a stainless uh, steel cylinder that you could uh, register your name. My name should be there. <laughs> Wow. But no ropes. No, <laughs> no nothing. <Wow>. Yeah. <laughs> Very dangerous thing. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Don't do that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.